Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hi everyone, how are you doing? So you remember what we were discussing in the last class? We were trying to discuss the problems basically with the alkyl halides. We have seen that alkyl halide is truly one of the most difficult partner we have in the carbon carbon bond formation reaction. The problem with alkyl halide is simply they do not want to give the desired product. If you take an alkyl halide, the metal complex of course, which is in a lower oxidation state will oxidatively add to the carbon halide bond into the alkyl halide will give let us say palladium 0 will give palladium 2 plus oxidative addition complex, but we as we have seen in the last class subsequently it will undergo or it may undergo a beta hydride elimination giving rise to the olefin as the side product. Once beta hydride elimination is going on the desired carbon carbon coupling product using alkyl halide as a starting material is going to be questionable. So, the mainly the beta hydride elimination is one of the problem that we have seen in the last class. Well, there is a way to solve this problem and simply if you take a bulky phosphine ligand which is bulky that means that it will not allow the beta hydride elimination to be facile because for beta hydride elimination you will need the increase in number of coordination site at the metal center. If the ligand is bulky such process such as beta hydride elimination will be somewhat retarded right. So, by having a bulky phosphine ligand one can think of reducing the beta hydride elimination product formation so to speak the olefin formation from alkyl halide and therefore, alkyl halide can give rise to the desired carbon carbon coupling product. We have seen that alkyl alkyl coupling in the last class like Suzuki coupling involving sp3 sp3 carbon center sp3 alkyl halide and sp3 alkyl boron reagent that was using uh, to give the uh, long chain alkane product. At the same time such method is not really valuable or not really um, useful for secondary and tertiary halide such palladium and let us say tricyclophosphine tricyclohexyl phosphine reactions are good for primary alkyl halide, but secondary alkyl halide what happens these reactions are really terrible. That is mainly due to the fact that the oxidative addition into alkyl halide is occurring by SN2 mechanism. As you know for oxidative addition into any alkyl halide, aliphatic um, any other aliphatic substrate or even aryl halide we have three different mechanism possible SN2 reaction. Okay, of course, radical reaction and concerted uh, processes for oxidative addition. Often for alkyl halide we have this SN2 reaction that means, if you are having the carbon bromide bond that carbon center where bromine is associated with the substrate over there will have a inversion during the uh, du during this oxidative addition. So, if that is happening you can imagine that secondary and tertiary halide will not undergo such SN2 reaction and that is the main reason why secondary and tertiary halide are problematic substrate for Suzuki reaction or for any usual, uh, usual carbon carbon bond formation reaction involving palladium. 
well we have seen shown that uh, also with a suitably designed substrate where alpha carbon and beta carbon are having two deuterium uh, one one deuterium each and once we are doing oxidative addition to this uh, alkyl halide we have seen the inversion in the alpha center. Now as we are trying to discuss that there is a way out to incorporate the secondary and tertiary halide and what is that? Well, we need to change the reaction mechanism. We cannot rely on palladium catalyst to do this thing because it relies on a SN2 mechanism for alkyl halide to undergo oxidative addition. On the other hand, if we take a different metal such as you know nickel which promotes or which prefers a radical pathway due to its mainly due to its electronic configuration. If you look at um, you know with the nickel lot of reactions are indeed radical in nature. What we can then expect that both primary, secondary and tertiary halide can participate into the carbon carbon bond formation reaction. Indeed not only that although it is a radical reaction with a suitable ligand with a chiral ligand we might will be even able to control the carbon carbon bond formation in a stereo, um, stereo control fashion. So, we will see those asymmetric version of those carbon carbon bond formation reaction today as well as introducing the nickel for the tough or most difficult carbon carbon bond formation reaction. Lot of these reactions or lot of these studies are done by Professor Geg Fuge group who is now at Caltech. So, most difficult reaction we are trying to see the better solution we along uh, the line while using the aliphatic substrate. Okay. We are trying to have a better solution. What is the solution? Nickel which is more prone to react with electrophile via radical pathway. Okay, that is the better solution compared to palladium and it works. So, for example, the previously what was not feasible as a reaction secondary alkyl halide reacting with Br2 well 1, 2, 3 let us say cut it down here with a phenyl and then the product that we are getting is going to be the one we would expect without much problem and this carbon carbon bond formation reaction is happening by using catalytic amount of nickel chloride, potassium tartbutoxide and 8 percent of a ligand that ligand L that is used in this case is the cyclohexyl, di cyclohexyl diamine NN dimethyl cyclohexyl diamine okay. that is the one that is being used. So, what we have seen right now is nickel as a catalyst now used for example, secondary alkyl halide which are not compatible with palladium because palladium cannot undergo oxidative addition in a reliable fashion to give the carbon carbon bond formation product. Oxidative addition will happen no problem, but you know the problem is we will end up uh, having lot of side product as well that is one of the problem. Another problem is the of course, is the SN2 reaction therefore, therefore problem could, could be even more during the oxidative addition as well. So, this is where nickel comes into picture and nickel helps us out for the overall process and we do see that a secondary sp3 center and a primary sp3 center now reacted in presence of nickel catalyst and a ligand that we have used 
is uh, the dicyclohexyl uh, N-N-dimethyl cyclohexyl diamine that is now giving nearly 80 percent yield which is quite amazing for this type of carbon carbon bond formation reaction. Okay, as we were discussing previously, we are not going to um, bring way too many examples at this point. We will come back maybe separately in uh, in a next in you know in future classes where we will discuss in more detail some of these things, some of these carbon carbon bond formation reaction. But we will now touch to give an overview of the field overall uh, and then then try to move on with the next carbon carbon. Uh, bond formation processes. As we discussed, there exist a number of uh, these carbon carbon bond formation processes, some we have discussed, some we will be discussing uh, in future as well. Let us look at the asymmetric version of these reactions where a chiral catalyst is used, that means a chiral ligand is used. So, ligand will control the stereochemistry at where uh, at the place where the carbon carbon bond formation is going on. Once again nickel we will be using as a catalyst and although these are radical mechanism still there will be an intermediate from which uh, of course, a radical intermediate will be formed from which which phase of the radical um, you know this nickel catalyst um, join or form the bond organometallic complex that determine the uh, stereochemistry into the product formation. Okay. Let us look at asymmetric stereoconvergent reactions. Asymmetric stereoconvergent Suzuki reaction. Okay, what we are starting with is a racemic compound. Okay. So, it is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 member ring 1, 2, 3, 4, no, there is no carbon in between. So, this is the starting material and we are taking this. So, this center is racemized not a stereo center, this is a racemic center. Okay. Now, we are trying to react with a aryl boron reagent to get the product. Here once again we are using nickel as the catalyst for example, nickel bromide we are using potassium tert-butoxide as the base at minus 5 degrees C we are taking and the ligand in this particular case the ligand we are using is the one developed nicely for this purpose and that works quite beautifully to give the product that we are looking for and uh, in actually it gives in quite acceptable level of the, the enantioselectivity selectivity in these cases. We have these compound. Now, we have 90 percent E E for this compound and nearly 80 percent yield for, for this compound again. So, that is quite good. right? So, we have the product starting from a racemic one that is most interesting. It is a racemic, racemic product, okay? racemic starting material and here we are able to generate the stereo center 90 percent E E and uh, 80 percent yield. So, that is I think it is quite amazing uh, because you know this is this is a asymmetric stereo conversion reaction and that to a Suzuki reaction. Well, you are forming a stereo center and that to also sp3 sp3 in nature um, that 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 is a I mean you know sp3 I mean particularly in this case sp3 sp2 carbon center between these two carbon center we are able to form and it is a very good reaction because this shows that it is not only possible to do such coupling reaction we can control the stereochemistry at the center. Okay. It was crucial to have that ligand 
okay. Ethylene diamine with substituted with diaryl ethylene basically it is a ethylene uh, diamine uh, based ligand, but those substituent aryl substituents are quite crucial for giving good yield and as well as the high, uh, high selectivity for this reaction. Let us look at one more example where once again uh, we will have this uh, stereoconvergent reaction as uh, stereoconvergent this Suzuki reaction utilizing the racemic starting material once again and then we will get only one product and in very uh, high enantioselectivity. selectivity. That is really a benchmark now for this kind of reaction to get this uh, asymmetric reaction uh, going starting from a racemic material, we will come to that how that might will be forming. Okay. Other, other stereoconvergent um, you know, st stereoconvergent asymmetric cross coupling reaction. Okay. There are nowadays plenty of uh, you know reports are there where we can do that. So, you can take basically now a uh, organo zinc reagent. Okay. So, that is going to be your Nigisi reaction once again with nickel no longer Suzuki we are talking it is a Nigisi reaction we are talking with nickel now with zinc reagent we can get uh, once again the same you know expected product where now even we have a sp3 sp sp3 carbon center this is the asymmetric center that will be generated the selectivity is 20 to 1 and 95 percent that's the regio selectivity regio selectivity 95 percent yield and 85 percent ee wow that's amazing and what we have over here is a pi box type of ligand and that works quite beautifully for this type of reaction and uh, you know this is this is quite amazing because um, you know this is a ligand controlled reaction where ligand is controlling the stereochemistry at the product. In the previous case what we have seen um, is mainly, mainly that we have a sp3 carbon center and then another, uh, another sp2 aryl group is coupled, is, is a, it was a sp3 sp2 coupling with the palladium that, that can be done quite efficiently by utilizing nickel catalyst. Once again it was a um, ethylene diamine based ligand. Now, over here what we have right now seen is a you know Nigisi reaction using zinc as the reagent. Now, in this reaction once again nickel is used, but we are even able to achieve sp3 sp3 which is again even much more challenging than any other carbon carbon bond formation reaction. We are able to do the sp3 sp3 carbon carbon bond formation as we have discussed why sp3. Uh, carbon centers are challenging. First of all, oxidative addition could be problematic, you know, because the mechanism is different. Usually, it is a radical mechanism, and then uh, most importantly, some side product formation can also happen uh, during oxidative addition or transmetallization reaction. Once after the oxidative addition or transmetallization, still beta hydride elimination is feasible. So, alkyl partner can undergo. Uh, olefin formation rather than going for the carbon carbon bond formation. Despite having all these problem, this nickel catalyst what if you are able to show that it can form the product under the Nigisi reaction condition where zinc is used uh, as a as a one of the coupling partner by after having that reaction uh, as if it was not sufficient, we can also have even the stereo center controlled with the help of the ligand. Well, that is that is got to be amazing because you know to have the sp3 sp3 carbon center first of all um, in a in a non asymmetric fashion is also very you know challenging task. After having that we, we can control the stereochemistry get the asymmetric center in a uh, you know set in a correct fashion 
um, that is that is quite uh, quite interesting. And for this purpose, we needed a tridented ligand, usually known as uh, um, these these are oxazoline based based of ligand, not the pi box. Sorry. And once we have that, we can go for the stereo center setting quite nicely with the right optimization we see that it, it gives the product in good yield and very high enantiomer selectivity. So, in this part what we have seen is the carbon carbon bond formation reaction mainly we were initially discussing the palladium catalyzed reaction. Palladium still remain I guess undisputed uh, you know king for this uh, carbon carbon bond formation reaction. Nevertheless, other metal can chip in can can be of great help. Uh, we did not discuss too much of different metals like cobalt um, you know uh, ruthenium, rhodium, iridium you know all, all other variety of metal that might will be uh, helpful for this reaction even iron. But we have seen just a glimpse of nickel what nickel can do if given a chance that nickel can solve some of those existing problem that we face in the literature and the main problem that we were discussing is to participate or is to make sure that sp3 carbon center is participating during this reaction and that can be done by a radical fashion nonetheless although this is a radical mechanism still we can control the stereochemistry if we start from the racemic mixture in a stereo conversion manner both R and S starting material is giving to one product. How that might will be happening we need to look at. Of course, as you could expect that radical will be forming first and then uh, definitely the ligand is controlling the chemistry. Let us look at just simply to give an overview of what might will be happening. Let us say you have the starting material R R prime with X up since it is a mixture. R R prime and X down. So, that is why if one is R another is S, but both of them will lead to the same intermediate and that is the radical intermediate right. So, this is a 2 degree or secondary secondary radical that is more stable more stable than primary one which is expected. From there on this nickel and ligand, ligand is to remind you ligand, ligand is a uh, you know of course, that there is there is a two stereo center in ligand. So, this is basically a diastereomeric or diastereomer of the ligand version we are taking two stereo center are already there which is essential for the for the stereo chemistry to be set and R R prime what we get is the nickel. So, ligand dependent cross coupling let us say for a particular ligand this now nickel is above the plane uh, because ligand has two stereo centers already in it only one geometry will be possible for the metal center to bind with it in a in a uh, more preferable or more friendly manner and therefore, this is the intermediate since one intermediate is forming from this uh, from this um, radical intermediate uh, this is the one which will control the stereochemistry of the product formation. Now, during these processes we also should tell you that um, you know as all of us are familiar with for any asymmetric reaction you need two stereo centers. Okay. One stereo center could be in your product formation another stereo center could be inside your ligand formation, but, uh, but what is most important that for any of the asymmetric reaction okay, when let us say we are forming a enantiomer. Of course, as you know enantiomer are not separable by normal column, because for separating any enantiomer you need another interaction for another stereo center. So, namely a chiral column. So, a column material that is having a chiral uh, center already in it. So, the material is already chiral. So, your product enantiomer will two different enantiomer will interact with the chiral center in a different fashion and that is how we get the uh, go get the separation in 
chiral GC, chiral HPLC that means chiral column containing GC, chiral column containing HPLC. So, if your compound is having one stereocenter, you need help from another molecule or another support which will help you identify or help you interact with those enantiomer differentially during the uh, during the product isolation. If so this is why if you are tr taking two enantiomer of the same compound R and S and you are trying to run a column by uh, by uh, by st by the normal column you will not be able to separate them out but that normal column material if there is a chiral center already existing then your compound r and compound s will interact with that chiral molecule differentially and therefore will give the separation because the retention time will now differ for your r compound may interact with the column material which is a chiral material differentially compared to the S material and therefore, you will get the separation if you are carefully setting the reaction condition. But does not matter how careful you are if the normal column if what we run um, in uh, for isolating enantiomer will never be possible. Similarly, if you take the enantiomer you want to do NMR. Uh, you, you want to run NMR uh, you know experiment, you will not be able to isolate or separate out or identify this enantiomer because uh, NMR itself is not a chiral uh, instrument that has chirality included into it. But the similarly same GC, normal GC, normal HPLC, normal GCMS you will not be able to um, identify two enantiomers. But if you have a chiral column in GC, GCMS, HPLC or a chiral shift reagent in NMR, you might you might will be able to separate out or quantify the two enantiomers that you are dealing with. Okay. So, remember two stereocenters are necessary for 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 uh, you know giving the uh, giving the product separation. Similarly, if <coughs> this is where you need to have a chiral version of the ligand because ligand will interact with the uh, with the two product that is R and S product if it is forming in differentially and therefore, the corresponding transition state that is leading to R product and S product will be different in energy. Otherwise, enantiomer transition state energy are the same. So, unless there is a diastereomer formation in one form or the other most often it is the ligand that is controlling the ligand controlling the uh, interaction of the metal center with that substrate that is R or another substrate that is S depending on, on the ligand stereochemistry the energy of these corresponding transition state that will be diastereomeric in nature because now you have a stereo center in the starting material also stereo center in the ligand and another stereo center the same let us say S stereo center in the starting material and R stereo center in the starting material. Now, these even if you take the racemic mixture of the starting material the ligand stereo center will determine which energy or which transition energy corresponding to the product formation is higher in energy therefore, that product formation will not be happening in larger amount if you are to get a enantiomer in, uh, in, in high excess. So, always remember that two stereocenters are necessary for any asymmetric reaction although your product or starting material might will be controlling one stereocenter or responsible for one stereocenter another stereocenters must be there at somewhere that is at the at the at the ligand stage usually. Otherwise, if it is a diastereomer that you are forming, you may not have to worry about anything because you are forming diastereomer. That means, the let us say two diastereomers having one is 1 R 1 S or 2 S another is 2 S 1 R right. So, that I mean if as long as the stereocenters are different at two different product they will have two different transition energy. Once you have such compound the two stereo center in one molecule that means, you will be able to isolate those compound by normal column chromatography. Okay. If you run a normal GC, normal HPLC without any chiral column or even NMR 
will be experiment you will be able to give you the or able to help you identify the product. So, enantiomer are not separable by your column simple column or simple instrument like NMR, GC, HPLC, but enantiomers are separable if you have another help from the GC column or HPLC column or the if there is a chiral shift reagent in the NMR. Okay. Similarly, on the other hand the diastereomers are separable by normal column because two stereo centers are already there you need you do not need any help the diastereomer can be isolable or separable by in GC or in HPLC without any chiral column you should be able to do that. Okay. We might will discuss these or their relative energies of different enantiomers and diastereomers what are the requirement on a different class. Till then keep studying we will come back with some more of those carbon carbon bond formation reaction in the next class. Bye bye.